He said he's making a statement. I am that I am. Go ahead. He said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Go ahead. And the Most High said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham. You heard that? The Lord God of your fathers. When it says Lord God there, that's when he gave Moses the name. Okay, the tetragram in English. Okay, we're going to prove that. Go ahead. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. So when he says, the Lord God of what? The Lord God of your fathers. Of your fathers. So that's when he gave Moses his true name. He, in, in the Hebrew it says, Yahweh. Okay, we're going to show that to you. Read that last part again. I like that. It says, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. Right. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. Remember Proverbs 30, it says, what is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell. So now, go to the Hebrew and read what you just read, 13, you read from 13 to 15. Read it in the Hebrew, okay? Exodus 3.13. We're going to read it in the Hebrew and give you understanding in the English. So that's what it says in the Hebrew. What you Amma, Masha, Moses said, Al Ha'alahayim said unto the powers, which is the God. Right, can I say this real quick? When you get to that, it says Alahayim, right? In your Bible, it says God. Okay, when, when you examine, when you look up in this book, like we have here, Ben Yehuda's uh, Hebrew English, English Hebrew Dictionary, when you look up in here and you look up the word God, it says Allah, and when it says Allahayim, it's plural for powers, okay? That's what Allah means, God or powers. Okay, so go ahead. I'll read again. Why you Amma, Masha, and Moses said, Al Allahayim unto the power, Hana. Anakya, behold, when I come, Ba'a, to, which is Al, Banya, Yeshua'al, to the children of Israel. So I'm going to read again. It says, Waya Amma, Masha, Al, Ha'alahayim, Hana, Anakya, Ba'a, Al, Banya, Yeshua'al. And Moses said unto the power, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, that's what we read in the Hebrew, and this way you shall say unto them, it says, Wayamatha Faya Laham Alha Alahaya say unto them, the God of your fathers, Abakyakum Shalach Naya, the God of your fathers sent me unto you. Let's go and explain, continue on. Alahayakum Wa ama amawa laya ma shamwa say unto them and they shall say unto you and they shall say unto me what is his name shamwa ma ama alahayum wa ya ama and this is what the most I say unto Moses this is what you shall say unto them wa ya ama alahayum the power Al Masha say unto Moses, Ahaya, which I am, Ahaya means I am, Ashara means that, Ahaya means I am that I am. Right, and that's a statement. When he says Ahaya, Ashara, Ahaya, I am that I am. That's he's saying, he's letting Moses know, look, I am that I am. He didn't give him his name yet in that verse. Go ahead. Wayama, Wayama, Ka, the Ama, La Banya, Yesha Allah. And he said, and he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ahaya, Shalach Naya, I am, have sent me unto you. Wayama, 
a word alahayum and the power said moreover unto moses alahayum al masha say unto moses ka fa ama al banya yesha Allah say unto the children of israel yahawa we're gonna read and he said and the power said moreover unto moses thus shall thou say unto the children of israel the lord god of your fathers i'm gonna read again it says Alahaya Abafya come the power, your powers, the powers of your fathers, ha Allah, excuse me, let me go back to it again. It says, Wa yamawa Aywad Alahayum Al Masha Ka Fa Ama Al Banya Yasha Allah say unto the children of Israel, Yahawa Alahaya Alahaya Abafya come, the Lord God of your fathers have sent me unto right. you. So when it said Yahweh there, like you just read, that in the English Bible it says the Lord God. That's what it says. The, type, the name translated the Lord God in the Hebrew is Yahweh. That's when he gave Moses his name. And the next part that Benjamin is going to read is going to tell you. All right, so let's read again. So it says, Wayama, we're in the 15th verse. Wayama. A word alahayum al masha ka the amar al banya yesha Allah. and the power said moreover the 15th verse and the power said moreover unto Moses thus shall thou say unto the train of Israel I was going to explain it says shalach naya when I send you unto the train of Israel and it says Yahweh Yahweh Alahaya Abafya come, the Lord God of your fathers. But read in the Hebrew, I read again. Yahweh. That's the name. When it says Lord God in the English, that's the name right there. Yahweh. The four characters that, like I showed you earlier, one second, we're going to go back to that. This is what you're reading in the Hebrew. The Yahweh. The tetragram derived from that. The Y, the H, the W, H. Okay, that's the name. In English, this was translated to the Lord God. Go ahead. So it says in English, the Lord God of your fathers. Now I'm going to read in the Hebrew. Yahweh, Alahaya, Abafyakum, Alahaya, Abaraham, Alahaya, Yatazakwa. It says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Wa Alahaya Ya Aikwa and the God of, of Jacob Shalach Naya Alahaya come Za Shamya La Ay La Ailam Wa Za Zakaya La Da Da and he says I've sent me unto you this is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. So when he said, this is my name forever, he was referring to Yahweh. In the English it said, Lord God. So that's the name of the Heavenly Father. Okay? So from there, go to Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3, which gives you a brief synopsis of that. Okay? Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3. Read the English, and then we're going to read the uh, Hebrew. Exodus chapter 6 in the third verse in English and it says and I appeared unto Abraham unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty by the name of God Almighty now we're going to examine that too in the Hebrew because that's not his name go ahead that was a title go ahead but my name but by my name but by my name the Lord the Lord there in the Hebrew is going to say Yahweh once again was I not known to them? Right. He didn't reveal his true name until Moses came on the scene. Now go over into the Hebrew. Now we're going to read in the Hebrew. Exodus 6 and 3. Wa ara'a al-Abraham, and I appeared unto Abraham. So I just read in the Hebrew. Wa ara'a al-Abraham, and I appeared unto Abraham. Al-Yatazakwak, unto Isaac. Wa al unto Jacob, Ba'Allah, Shadya, 
Washamya, and, and by the name of the, of God Almighty, and the name of God Almighty, it said Shadya. That was the read that part again. But Allah Shadya, Shadya. You know what that means? Dem, de, demon-like, demonical. Okay, that was a title he was given from the time of the flood. That's how um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him. They knew him as Allah Shadya. The terrible power. The terrible power, the terrible demonic power. Now we know the Lord is not a demon, but it just means all-knowing and fierce and terrible. I'm going to prove that. Real quick, hold that. I'm going to go back to this uh, Ben Yehuda's pocket English Hebrew, Hebrew English dictionary. And I'm going to go to page 82. And when you look up the name Shadya, it says demonic. So that was a title the people of the earth knew him by. Okay, they knew him as the almighty Allah Shadya, the terrible demon-like power. Now that's a heavy title. <laughs> Most dreadful right. is terrible power. So people heavy. say God is all love. The people back there they, they called him the demon power. They said, this, this power is terrible. He kills everybody on the earth during the flood. Okay? I like to read again. It says, But Allah, Shadya, Washamya, Yahawah, La'a. He said, By the name of Yahawah, I was not known. Right. He was not known by the name Yahawah. Nada wa aithya laham. I was not known unto them by the name of Yahweh. So the most I was telling Moses, his name Yahweh at that time was not known unto them, but it was known as Baala Shadia, the terrible and dreadful power. Right. And it, with Allah is the Hebrew word for, for God or power. That's what it means. So he was known as Allah Shadia, the terrible demon power. <laughs> because as we stated, he killed everybody on the planet Earth. Is that hard for you to understand? He killed everybody, mm -hmm. except Noah and his sons and their wives. Right, during the time of the flood. Right, so now a lot of you may be sitting home because you think you're smart. Well, that, uh, that tetragram is pronounced yu hey wav hey That's a lie. It ain't yu hey wav hey There are no vowels in the Hebrew. Okay, I'm going I'm to get that. Let me go back to this. Uh, ben Yehuda's pocket, pocket English Hebrew, Hebrew English Dictionary. I'm going to go to the front where it, get, it says Hebrew pronunciation. Okay. I'm on, I'm on the, uh, you know, in the preface, on page two of the preface. It says Hebrew pronunciation. It says the Hebrew alphabet, like all Semitic alphabets, consists solely of consonants. Twenty-two in number. Okay. The following chart gives the form, printed and written, name, English, and Hebrew, pronunciation, and numerical value of each consonant. So now, on this page on, uh, of the preface, page three, it gives you the old Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew characters, and then the printed, printed Hebrew, excuse me, over here, the printed Hebrew, which they call to today the Assyrian Hebrew that everyone's familiar with. So there are no vowels there, and I'm going to prove that further on. It says they were made of consonants, right? I'm going to go into this book entitled The New Jewish Encyclopedia, okay? And I'm going to look up vowels. Let's see what they say in here. And if Bunyamin could uh, read it for me, T-U-V. <laughs> because this is important. All right. Right there. It says vowels. This yeah. is on page 506. It says vowels, Hebrew. All the letters of the Hebrew alphabet are consonants. And essentially to this day, the Hebrew language is written almost entirely without vowels. It says that because there's two sounds in the ancient Hebrew. You had the ah sound and the I. That's why it says almost entirely. Because you had the I sound. That's the hard sound, and the ah gives you that soft sound. Those are the only two sounds in the Hebrew alphabet. Go ahead. The scroll of the Torah is written without pronunciation, marks, and without vowels. So there were no vowels, like the A is not there in the Hebrew. 
The E is not there in the Hebrew. The O is not there in the Hebrew. The U is not there in the Hebrew. Only Bibles, prayer books, poetry, and beginner's books are printed with vowels. Right, those are those dots. When you examine in the, in the Tanakhs today, they got some little dots under it. That's the white man introducing vowel sounds, and it's going to say that. The popular use of vowels points began as late as the 8th century. Vowels began as late as the 8th century. Do you hear this? So his name is not yu hey wav hey with them vowels in it. Do me a favor. Let's find out what happened during the 8th century. Right. Uh, look up um, Cajun. Bullying. Cajun bullying, yeah. Let me see. Bullying, yeah. So we're going back into this book and find out what happened in the 8th century. So we're going to read on page... This is on page 265. It's about the Khazars, like we just read. In the eighth century, it wasn't until the eighth century. And it says, the Khazars, a Mongolian people. Elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, it says Mongolian because the so-called white man had conquered the Chinese. As we read on, it's going to prove that it's the so-called white men who are indeed the Khazars, 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 however you want to say it, who are ruling. Go ahead. It, it says a Mongolian people, which is not actually true, who embraced Judaism and flourished from the 8th century. Flourished from the 8th century. So this is when the vowels were introduced by the Khazars, this Caucasian white man. And it's going to prove that. And give an example. Those are the same group that you see running around in Eastern Parkway, right. in Yeshiva Heights, in uh, Williamsburg, wearing the, uh, the black uh, Abraham Lincoln hat. With right, the Bobby Bar curls on the side. The Hasidim, right? The Hasidim over in Israel, all over the face of the earth. These are the same characters. And it says, it said, who embraced Judaism and flourished from the 8th century, the 10th centuries, on the territory extending between the Don and the Volga rivers. The Don and the Volga rivers in Russia. Go ahead. And the shores of the Black and Caspian and Azov Sea. So it's giving you an area. What's between the Don, the Volga, the Black and the Caspian Seas? The Caucasus Mountains. That's where the terminology Caucasian was derived from. So who were the Khazars? The Caucasian man. Okay, because they came from the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Now turn the page and let's get to history. Right. Oh, nice. And uh, I'd like to say too that uh, a lot of people teaching in the school system that the so-called white race came from Japheth. This is not true. The so-called race conquered the Japhetic people, who are the true Aborigines or what the people that's occupying the Pacific Islands, as the Hawaiians, the Polynesians, the Samoans, the Tahitians, the Australian Aborigines. Now, the so-called white people are all Edomites. Right. They're not Japhetic. That's a lie. They conquered the Japhetic people that was occupying Europe, and they had them expelled from those countries. So let's read on. The Khazars and their conversion to Judaism his name was called Cajun Bullen. That was the main guy that became converted and passed on this heritage to the rest of his four parents or his ancestors. It says, Khazars and they converted to Judaism. Bullen, the pagan ruler of the Khazars, his desire to embrace the true religion had summoned representatives of the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faiths to expand their views on the superiority of their respective religions. So what was happening during this time when the Khazars on the Cajun Bullen, when he came into existence, what he did, right, it says the Khazars and their conversion to Judaism. Now, the Jews are the so-called black people in this country called Afro-Americans, along with the so-called West Indian Haitians. When we were ruling in Europe and all over the face of the earth during this time period, the so-called white man under the name of Cajun Bullen as the Khazars became converted to Judaism. So what was taking place, the two main factions at this time was the Israelites and the Arabs, the Muslims. We had wars amongst ourselves. So now, Cajun Bull was in a toss-up of which one of the doctrines of uh, religions or philosophy is going to choose. I'm going to continue reading. It says, the Khazars and they converged to Judaism. Cajun Bullen, the pagan ruler of the Khazars, and his desire to embrace the true religion had summoned representatives of the Christian. Now, the Christians at this time were also the Israelites. We were, we were divided into two different sects, the Christians and the Byzantine 
and also were known as the Jews. So it says he summoned Christian, Muslim. Now the Muslim are the enemies to the Israelites. These were the Arabs. They are not our people. Two different nations of people, enemies, rivals. The Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faith. The Jewish faith, of course, was who? The Israelites, not the so-called white people today. They became converted in the, in the, in the 8th century, as we're going to prove further. And it says, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faiths to expand their views on the superiority of their respective religions. Bonin thus became convinced of the truth of the Jewish faith. And he, as well as many of his noblemen, embraced Judaism, which later spread widely among the common people of the Khazar kingdom. So at this time, in the 7th century, which was 740 AD, going to the 8th century, these so-called white people embraced the nationality or the heritage of the true Israelites. This is where you have the term Jewish people you have today, the people in Israel, in New York, and all over the face of the world come and say, Jewish people in Israel. This is where they embrace our nationality and our heritage. Right. I have one thing to say to you so-called white people that claim to be Jews. Two things. Ata lo Yehudi and Ata Mumza. Okay? And uh, read on. Right. And it says, the Khazars were warlike people, scavengers, bumps. When you read the history on the under Arthur Kosler, boy, the history that you read about these so-called so-called white people is pathetic. It'll sicken you until you used to wear the underwears until it became dry rotten. And they would pick lice out of their beards and eat the lice as rice krispies. They were filthy. Right. And it says the Khazars were warlike people and succeeded in extending their rule and influence so they spread the influence all over when it started to emerge as being called the jews in the latter part of the eighth century coming all the way down to this present day and it says they were subjected to occasional attacks by the byzantines now the byzantines were who the so-called blacks in this country along with the west indians and haitians we ruled the byzantine empire in that during that time period then we were finally destroyed in 1453 by the Ottoman Turkish Empire in Istanbul. And it says, by the, it said they were subjected to occasional attacks by the Byzantines and later by the Russians. That was the black Jews also. There were also black people that ruined that part of Russia right. under uh, Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, uh, uh, different, different uh, leaders that ruled Russia in the 8th century, 10th century, and the 10th century, and so forth. And it says, by the end of the 10th century, they succumbed to the Russians. And after maintaining themselves for a short period in the Crimea, which is the Caucasus Mountains, right, some gradually embraced the Christian or Muslim faith. Now, this is the part where you get some of the white Christians and the white-looking Arabs over in the different parts of the Middle East, over in Bosnia, over in, uh, in Russia. It's where all these groups stem from. They came from the Khazars. Even those that's occupying is uh, Israel, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, they came from two different sources, three different sources, I should say. The Greeks, the Romans, and the, and the Khazars. These are the main three groups of white people that you have occupying the Middle East that are claiming to be so-called Jewish and Muslim today. And it says, some gradually embraced the Christian or Muslim faith, ceasing to exist as a separate people through many Though, though many join with their Jewish brethren. Right, so that gives you the history on how the so-called white man became a Jew, how they also got into Islam, okay, and how they also got into Christianity. We're just going to go into this book entitled uh, The 13th Tribe, written by Arthur Kosler for a brief moment. At the top it says, the startling new discovery about the true ancestry of the Jewish people will cause a stir. <laughs> so let's read what uh, this so-called white man discovered. Arthur Kosler himself was a so-called Jew, a so-called Jew. We say so-called because that's what they're called. That's not what they really are. So we're going to go to page 16, and we're going to go over to verse 7, page 17 real quick. The question of how far we can go in regarding this Khazar Jewry, what we just read about in the uh, 
the Jewish ancestry book, History of Jewish People. It says, the question of how far we can go in regarding this case of Jewry, as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe, the bastards that's dwelling throughout all Germany, Russia, even Israel over there, all around, the descendants of this settlement, those who stayed where they were, those who immigrated to the United States, throughout Eastern Parkway, throughout all over the United States, you got them saying, I am a Jew, I am a Jew, I'm ye Yehudi. No, you're not, and it's going to prove it. It says, and to other countries, like in Spain, they have them in Spain, they call themselves Sephardic Jews, okay? In Germany, they're called Ashkenaz Jews, all right? And those who went to Israel. In 1948, they were established there by the United Nations, okay, as the Israelites, as the Jews of the Bible, which they're not. And also by the British mandate and by the United States government. Right, okay. It says, which goes on, constitute now the large majority of the world of Jewry. Verse, page 17. This was written before the full extent of the Holocaust was known, where they killed a few 600 white people. But that does not alter the fact that the large majority of surviving Jews, surviving white people, in the world is of Eastern European, and thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin. If so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, like the true Jews of the Bible, those of Negro and Indian descent, but from the Volga. So it's letting you know the white, so-called white man who claims to be a Jew, his ancestry does not come from the Jordan over in Israel, but from the Volga, which is in the Caucasus Mountains, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race, of the so-called white race. All right. Let me jump down. Okay, I said the word Aryan comes from the word, from the Persian word meaning, comes from the word Iran. Right. That's where the word Aryan comes from. It means the Persians. Right. And that's where you got the word Iran from. Exactly. Iran comes from the word Aryan, which means the Persian people. So I'm going to jump down now. It says, the story of the Khazar Empire, as it is slowly, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. Now check that out. What you going to do with that? This is a so-called white man that discovered he would himself was not a Jew, according to the Tanakh, according to the Torah, according to the Bible. He discovered this. Okay? So now, let's get back into the name of the Heavenly Father. Okay? Uh, when you examine the name of the Most High, Yahweh, okay, where the tetragram, you got the Y-H-W-H. Oh, let me go into this real quick. So what did... What we've discovered so far is that the Father's name is not Jehovah, because there's no J in the Hebrew, okay? Neither was there a V, because the V, the V came from the Latin language, okay? There's no E in the Hebrew, like when they got Jehovah with the E there, there's no E because that's a vowel. Neither it is Jeho with an O, okay, because an O is a vowel. That came in the 8th century, the end of the 8th century. Okay, so now, look up, go to the, uh, did you find the, uh, find it. look it up. It says, it where are you at? Tell them where you at. We're in uh, the Ben Yehudi's uh, English Hebrew uh, uh, Dictionary. And this is on page 117, and it says, God's name, and it has the first letter, the Yah and the Ha. Right, the Yah means He. That stands for He, okay? Go to the uh, front for me real quick, and look up the tenses. Okay, right, right there. And then what the, page are you on? We're on page, uh, page ten, 10 of the prefix. And the prefix, and it says, this is, it gives you the present tense, and it has hawa. Right, hawa, for present tense. And when you go down, it says am or is. So when it says ya hawa, let's look at it again. When it says ya, standing for he, the hawa means is or present. He is. Okay, that's his name. Yahweh. Okay, it's not you hey, wild hey. There's no vowels as we prove. We proved it. That's not his name. Neither his name is his name. His name is not Yahweh. Yahweh or Jehovah. That's not his name. Neither is his name. Let's go back to this. 
real quick. Oh, yeah. oh here we go. Right, right. Let me go look at this real quick. This is, check this out. I wrote down Jehovah for you. How did the scholars come up with this name? They broke up this name into syllables. Three syllables. G Ho Va. Three syllables. We proved there's no J in the Hebrew already. We proved there's no E because the vowels came at the end of the 8th century under the white man, okay? Neither is there an O. There's no O. That also came about during the end of the 8th century. So his name is not Jehovah, okay? And there's no V because that's a Latin letter. There's no V in the Hebrew. So what did they do? The scholars kept the syllable, syllable breakup of Yah. Hawa, the three syllable sound, and they simply changed the letters. They changed the, the Ya sound, the Y to the J, the I to the N to the E. They changed the A here, the A sound, I'm, I'm sorry, the A sound to an O, okay, and they changed the Wa to a Ba, okay. Now, let's further prove that this is correct down here. I'm going to go to this book entitled The Concise Dictionary of English Etymology. Okay. It says the Concise Dictionary of English Etymology by Walter W. Skeet. Inside this book, we're going to go to page 225 and look up the name Jehovah. It says Jehovah, Hebrew, Yahovah, or more correctly, Yahava, God. See article on Jehovah in Dictionary of the Bible. So now, I blew up this page, okay? I want to... So let's examine the name that they have written here for Jehovah. It says Hebrew. Hebrew. Yahovah. Or, more correctly, Yahava. See, they got the first two characters correct. Yaha. Okay? But then they throw, they stick that V in there, okay, V and the E again. We already showed, they already made the statement that there's no E in the Hebrew, neither is there a V, because the V is a Latin letter, okay? So, when you go back to the Bible dictionary, read Jehovah, now check this out, read the Bible dictionary again. This On what is, page? Uh, this is page, page 270, Jehovah, the English rendering of the Hebrew tetragram. Wa, ya, ha, wa, y, h, w, h, one of the names of the Most High. Its original pro pronunciation is unknown. Now that's the lie. Its original pronunciation is unknown. How do you know that's the lie? Because when we, when we went to the concise dictionary of English etymology, which is the history of the root of a word, when we looked up Jehovah there, it says Jehovah, Hebrew, Yahovah, or more correctly, Yahava. Okay, so they know the Lord's name. So then, thereby examining it, when we go look at the name Jehovah, the three-syllable breakup, the tetragram, the Y, the H, and the W and the H is pronounced Yahawa. Now, let's, we're going to go to another history book entitled History of the American Indians by James Adair to show you that the Native American Indians knew the name of the Most High and they called on it. Let's go to page 50. Hold up the book for the camera so that they can see the title of the name of the book and we're going to go to page 50. Okay. And you're going to start right here and use no, read the whole, read what I have underlined. It says that this seems to be the true Hebrew pronunciation. This is on page 50. That this seems to be the true Hebrew pronunciation of the divine essential name. Yah, Ha, Wa, and he has his name, the Yah, the Ha, the Wa, and the Ha, which is Yahweh. They have a Jehovah, which is wrong. Will appear more obvious from the sound they seem to have given their characters. The Greeks, who chiefly copied their alphabet from the Hebrew, had not, had not Yad, but Torah. Okay, that, that should be goes Greek. in the Greek. Right, now jump down. It says, and use. And use the consonant W 
instead of V. Right. The, it's letting you know the consonant W was correct. And read that part again and use the consonant. And use the consonant W instead of V. Right. So they use the consonant W in the name of the Lord instead of the V because the V came in with the so-called white man. That's what it said. Read it again. And it says, use, and, and use the consonant W. And use the consonant W. Remember, it said that the Hebrew alphabet was consonants. Go ahead. Instead of V. Instead of V. So what does this prove? That the name of the Lord is Yahweh, not Jehovah. Read on. It says, the high importance of the subject necessarily necessarily would lead these supposed red Hebrews. They say red Hebrews talking about the Native American Indians who are people of color, brown, not red. Go ahead. And let me say this concerning this book. In a preface, in the beginning, the opening, it says, published in London in 1775. Okay. So this is an old book, an ancient book, because a lot of you run to get books that's with copyrights 1995 or something like that and what do you get lies but these old books before they allowed blacks and latinos in their school system had lots of truth in it because they didn't figure you'd be in school reading 1775 where were you blacks and latinos getting whooped carrying a white man around you wasn't reading these books okay so go back to that again and then it says and it says and printed in the united states in 1930 for the first time right so now what is that showing you america was suppressing the truth of who the north american indians were and what language they spoke right because all the tribes are located here in america so america had to suppress the truth exactly so let's go back to that about the use of the consonant w instead of b go ahead and it says and the use and the use and and the you and use the consonant W instead of V. We use the consonant W instead of V because V is incorrect. Go ahead. The high importance of the subject necessarily would lead these supposed red Hebrews. And he says supposed red Hebrews because the Native American Indians, which I am one myself, we're not red. We're dark skin, ranging from a light brown to a very dark brown. The so-called white man is the real red man. That's why we call him so-called white, because when you really look at him, he's red. Okay, and when it says red Hebrews, it's referring to the Israelites. Read on. When separated from other people in America to continue to repeat the favorite name of the Most High. The favorite name of the Most High is the same name he gave to Moses. That's his favorite name, his true name. Go ahead. And here it has Yohiwa. Right. Now this scholar put Yohiwa. He put yo he and he put the e here, I mean o here, and he put an e here. So they just switched it. That's what these scholars do. But in here they have the correct thing, the correct end. They have the wa. Okay, so we know this is the true name of the father. Yahweh. Okay? That's the name all of you so-called blacks and Latinos, you true Israelites, you're supposed to call on the name of the Heavenly Father. Yahweh. Okay? So now. From there, let's go to the book of uh, Malachi, chapter one. We're going to go to Malachi chapter one, and we're going to—I want the bottom of verse fourteen, okay—to show you something about the heavenly Father's name. Why all this cover? Why? What's the deal? Okay, Malachi one and fourteen. But cursed be the deceiver, which having his flock a male, and vow and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. So this is what the Israelites were doing. Our forefathers was sacrificing lame animals to the Father. The Most High was mad at us. We were supposed to sacrifice the choice of the flock. And we said, well, we want to save the choice for ourselves. That lamb over there got a broke leg. I think I'll sacrifice that one to him. And the Most High was mad at that. Go ahead. I am, for I am the great king, saith the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful among the nations. The Father's name is dreadful amongst the nations. Why? Because when you call on the true name of the Most High, that's power. That is power. The angels stand up when they hear that name. Okay? Real quick, go to Romans uh, 10 and 13. Okay? Romans chapter 10 and 13. 
And before we go, I'd like to elaborate. When we read here, it says among the heathen, but the word heathen only means nation. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the Most High's name is dreadful amongst the other nations, but amongst you Israelites, you're supposed to adore and cherish his name and want to call on his true name, Yahweh. So, Romans 10, 13, let's check this out. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever of Israel, that's what it means, shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you check out the Hebrew, which we're going to do later on, it says, for whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. So the white man and his demon actions, he changed the name of the Lord. And he says, let's have the true Israelites, the, the, those blacks and Latinos, call on Jehovah. Let's have them call on Jehovah. But that's not the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is Yahweh. Okay? When you read in the Hebrew, this is how it's written. Yahweh. The Tetragrammaton, as we read in the Bible Dictionary, translated it Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce these four characters? Yahweh, a three-syllable sound. Yahawa. You connect the last two characters. Yahawa. Connect the last two. The first two are separate. Yahawa. In the English, where you have the Y-H-W-H, the first two are pronounced separate. Yaha. The last two are connected. Wa, Yahawa. Okay? So now, what we're going to do is go to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 now. Real quick, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14 and 1. Check out what Christ said to John while, Christ, uh, while John was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. Listen closely. Revelation 14 in the first verse. And I look, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. The lamb is Christ, Yahawashai, read. And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand. And with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, which are leaders of the nation of Israel. Twelve thousand males out of every tribe of Israel. Twelve thousand of Judah. Twelve thousand of Benjamin. Twelve thousand leaders of Levi. Twelve thousand leaders of Ephraim. So on and so on. Read. Having his father's name written in their foreheads. Read that part again. It says, having, having his father's name. Having his father's name. What's his name? Yahweh. Go ahead. Written in their foreheads. What does it mean, written in their foreheads? It doesn't mean you get a pencil and write it on your skin. It means in your mind, in your spirit. That's what it means, having the Father's name written in your forehead, meaning in your mind. You know the Father's true name. That's why it says, for whosoever, meaning of Israel, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's going to be saved? 144,000, which also includes one-third of Israel, as is proved in another scripture. Okay, so read it again. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood under Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, Having his father's name written in their foreheads. So now, having their father's name written in their foreheads, meaning having the father's true name, Yahweh, in their minds. So let's go back to Romans 10. Right, I like to say this too, you have uh, some Israelites, group of Israelites, that know they're Israelites, that's taking on the custom of the so-called white man. Instead of saying the most high's name, they will say Hashem, Hashem, the name. We won't say his name, his name is too holy. Right. But if you're a chosen vessel of the most, uh, you're a chosen people, you should pronounce his name. You should say his name. Right. And it's not Hashem. That's right. not his name. That means, uh, it only means the name. <laughs> so go back to Romans 10, 13 again and read down. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So now we found out who's going to be saved, who's going to be calling on the name of the Lord. 144,000 of the nation of Israel. They have their father's name written in their minds. Yahweh. So we're the ones calling on the name of the Lord. Read. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So, but how can you call on the name of the Lord if you have not believed the, on the Lord, the true Lord of that the Bible's talking about? Okay. About a black man. <laughs> <laughs> so go 
back to Romans 10, 13 again and read down. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So now, we found out who's going to be saved, who's going to be calling on the name of the Lord. 144,000 of the nation of Israel. They have their father's name written in their minds. Yahweh. So we're the ones calling on the name of the Lord. Read. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So, but how can you call on the name of the Lord if you have not believed the, on the Lord, the true Lord of that the Bible's talking about? Okay. About a black man with woolly hair sitting on the throne who killed everybody on earth and only gave his name to Moses and did not give his name to everybody. He only gave it to Moses to give to the children of Israel. Have you believed on him? No. The guy you believed on is a white guy who gave his name to everybody. That's not in the Bible what you're talking about. Read on. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Have you heard of the Lord being named Yahweh? The dreadful power. The dreadful power? Have you believed on that? Have you heard that? No. You heard about a guy named Jehovah who's a probably, in your mind, an old white man. Or some of you say, oh, he ain't got no, he's just a cloud of smoke. Okay. Read it again. It says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You have not heard Yahweh is his name. You've heard Yuhewa. How do they say? Yuhewa. Hey. You've heard of Allah from Farrakhan. You've heard Jehovah from the Christian church. You've even heard Yahwa. Okay. But you have not heard Yahweh. Read on. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You need someone to teach you correctly, as we're doing. But Yaman and myself and the other brothers within the house of David, teaching you the true name of the Father. Read. And how shall they preach except they be sent? The Father has to send you. If the Lord did not send you, sit your rusty butt down, listen and learn. Why be so prideful? Okay, you don't have the true Lord's name. We proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, read on. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. We're preaching the gospel of peace. What are we doing bringing peace between Israel and the Father again? Because we're showing you that when Christ died on the cross, he died for Israel. That brought peace between Israel and the Father, bringing us back into one nation again. Okay, one kingdom, okay? So now when we go out and we're teaching you, you must call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, in truth, in spirit and in truth. Go ahead. And bring glad tidings of good things. And we're bringing glad tidings of good things to you because Christ only died for the nation of Israel. He did not die for all nations, okay? Now, let's prove that Christ only died for Israel according to the Bible in the New Testament. Acts 5, and I believe it's verse 29. Let's start there. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey the Most High rather than men. Now, we ought to obey the Most High, Yahweh, rather than men. Now, the subject he's going to get into is who Christ died for. Did Christ die for the world, as man says, or did Christ die for the nation of Israel, as the Most High says? Read, the Most High of our fathers raised up Jesus. Yahweh raised up Jesus, whose true name is Yahweh Shai, read, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Right, you gave him to the Romans, and the Romans crucified Christ, read. Him hath the Most High exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So repentance and forgiveness of sins was for who? Israel. For who? Israel. So why are you out there teaching contrary to what the Bible says? Okay? So now, let's go to um, Exodus. Exodus 20 and 7. Um, wait, before you read it, the reason we're going to go to the law, we're going to go to the law on using the Lord's name in vain. First, understanding this. A lot of you that know you are Israelites throughout Chicago and different parts Canada. of the United States, Brooklyn, Canada. Okay, what you do, you know you're Israelites, and you know the correct spelling of the Lord's name, okay, which is Yahweh. You may not have the pronunciation correct, but you take this name, and you write it in your clothes, which you're not supposed to do, 
on your hats, on your staffs. You, you're not supposed to do that. Only Aaron the high priest was allowed to wear it on a, a band that was on his mitri. Art thou Aaron? No! Nobody else could do that. So you're not supposed to have it on your guest jeans, that name. Okay, then the rest of you attribute the Lord's name to your lying philosophy. Okay, you take the Lord's name and say, oh, the Lord loves everybody. That's using his name in vain, but he doesn't. He forgot he killed everybody on the earth and only saved Noah and his children. When he gave Christ to be the Savior to Israel, you'll read that and then say, no, that means uh, everybody. That's what you do in the simplicity of your mind. Okay, so let's get the law, Exodus 20 and 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So does that mean you're not supposed to use the name of the Lord? Or you're not supposed to call on the name of the Lord? No. We explain what it meant. So remember it says, Whosoever of Israel shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Now, let's get the law on that. Ex uh, Numbers chapter 6. I believe it's verse 22. 20, 23. 23. It says, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, start at 22. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, in the Hebrew it says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Meaning, Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. So when, you, when Aaron and I were doing the anointing prayer, they were saying, Yahweh, bless thee and keep thee. They were using the Lord's name. Go ahead. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee. Go ahead. And be gracious unto thee. Read. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. The Lord, meaning Yahweh, lift up his countenance upon thee. Go ahead. And give thee peace. And give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So it was a law for the Israelites to use and put the name of Yahweh upon one another. The priests were to do that, okay? So you're supposed to pray in the name of Yahweh. Pray to Yahweh. You Israelites, but for you others that are not Israelites, don't use that name. The white man understands that. That's why he said, uh, we better not play with that. Let's not use that name. Because why? Because he knows destruction is not far behind. Get Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. This is the future uh, prophecy. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. Because it's important for us to return to the true name of Yahweh. Okay? We're supposed to call on the name of Yahweh. In the ancient Hebrew, read Zephaniah 3 and 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. But then will I turn to the people, the people meaning the children of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, a pure what? A pure language. A pure language, which is ancient Hebrew, without the vowels. Go ahead. That they may call, that they, that they may all call upon, that they all, meaning all Israel, upon the name of the Lord that we may all call upon the name of Yahweh. Read the verse again. It says that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. We must call on the Lord, his true name, that we may serve him with one consent. You got all these different consents out here. You got one group calling him Jehovah. Another group of our people calling him you hey hey Another group calling him Yahweh. Another group of our people saying, Allah. Another group of our pe people saying, Yaqwa. That's madness. That's not with one consent. Because you have not sat down and studied and researched the name of the Lord, which we have, and discovered that his name is Yahweh. The Most High revealed it to us, okay, that his true name is Yahweh. You must all come under that name, all you Israelites. You must call on the name of the Lord with one consent. Okay, so now go back to Proverbs 30 and verse 4 again. Listen closely. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. Once again, 
who have ascended up into heaven? This is what we started with this scripture, and we're going to continue on. Who hath ascended into heaven? Which is who? Who ascended into heaven? The Son of the Most High. Go ahead. Or descended. Or descended. Who came down in the flesh and died for the nation of Israel? His Son, Christ, as you call him. Read. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? The Father. Go ahead. Who have bound the waters in a garment? Who has bound the waters in a garment? The Father, whose name is Yahweh, as we've proved. Go ahead. Who have established all the ends of the earth? Who has established all the ends of the earth? The Father, Yahweh. Go ahead. What is his name? What is his name? It's Yahweh. That's his name. Yahweh. Read. And what is his son's name? Name. Now, this is the topic we're getting into now. And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. If thou canst tell. Has, have you researched? Okay, we're going to prove the name of the son now. The name of the son is Yahweh Shah. Before we get into the name of the son of the Most High, let's take a brief look at the uh, ancient Hebrew and the Assyrian Hebrew so we can show you the proper pronunciation. Okay, on the, uh, when you count, starting on your left-hand side, start counting the columns, the first column, second, third, fourth, and fifth. The fifth column, which says square, that's the Assyrian Hebrew. The column to the left of it is entitled Old Hebrew. They both have the same pronunciations without the vowel sounds. Let's go through the sounds. Ah. Now, when you look at the column, I've got to say this briefly. The meaning, the meaning column, which the left is to the left of the old Hebrew. You see it says ox. That sound, the ah sound in ox, is the correct pronunciation of the ah. Okay? So that gives you an example of how, it's, how the uh, sounds go. Like I explained earlier, there are only two sounds in the Hebrew, the ah and the i, as I'm going to show you. Ah, we're going back to the old Hebrew and the square Hebrew. Ah. Ba, ga, da, ha, wa, za, cha, ta, ya, ka, la, ma. Na, sa, i. Let's stop right there. You see that? It looks like a circle. It says, it's pronounced i. Look to the left of the column. It says i. See the first word? I. That's how you pronounce that character. That is the correct pronunciation for that character. Those were the two sounds from the ah, meaning ox, and the i, meaning i. Okay, it's giving you the sound of those characters. Those are the two sounds. Now I'm going to read on. Pa, taza, kwa, ra, sha, and tha. Those were the proper pronunciation of the ancient Hebrew characters, okay, as well as the Assyrian char uh, characters without the vowel points. Those are the correct pronunciations. Okay, now, what we're going to do is continue on and finding out the proper and true name of the Most High Son, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. What is his true name in the ancient Hebrew? Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, and let's start at verse 21. Actually, when you Start from the top of the chapter. What's happening is it gives you the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It gives you his forefathers. So it's already introducing to you, to letting you know that, yes, Joseph and Mary had sex. Okay, so what happened here, Joseph and Mary had sex. Mary got pregnant before the wedding ceremony. And Joseph was somewhat embarrassed to the fact that his wife was pregnant before the marriage ceremony. So he was thinking about putting her away privately, okay? Then the angel, Gabriel, came to Joseph in a dream, and he said this concerning the child that Mary is going to bring forth in verse 21, Matthew 1, verse 21. And he says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. So the angel's telling Joseph, look, don't put Mary away. Okay, look, whatever you do, you got to marry her, just deal with her. Okay, and he says, look, she's going to bring forth a, chun, a son, 
And he said, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now that's the subject. The name is his name. That's English. We already proved to you that there's no J in the Hebrew. Okay, let's get that real quick. Where's the uh, book, the encyclopedia? I want to get that real quick. We're going to go to the World Book Encyclopedia, which is copyrighted in 1963, and we're going to read the history behind the letter J. It says, during, during the 1600s, an I at the beginning of a word was written with a tail. The J developed from these forms and became a symbol for the consonant J as in joy. Right, so now the letter J is telling you was created at the end of the 1600s, okay? So it's obvious that the Messiah's name could not be Jesus. It's impossible, okay? Go ahead. Occasionally, J has a Y sound. As in hallelujah. So now it's letting you know that the J occasionally has a Y sound. So it's letting you know that the name of Jesus, it, it did have a Y at the front of it, as we're going to prove. So now let's go back to the uh, New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Read it again. And it says, Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And it's going to tell you the meaning of Jesus. Read on. For he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus means Savior, or he saves, literally. That's what it means. He saves, he delivers, okay? It's also letting you know that Christ only died for the nation of Israel. It said he would save who? His people from their sins. His people. His. That's possessive. His people from their sins. Is If Bruce Lee came for his people, you automatically know he, you're, he's referring to Chinese people, okay? Or if David Duke or Tom Metzger, the head of the KKK, said they came for their people, you know that doesn't include everybody. So it said Christ would come to save his people. To save his people. Who are his people? The Israelites from their what? their sins from their sins okay so now let's read matthew 121 in the hebrew please all right matthews 121 in the hebrew and this is what it says bon. so this is what this is what uh the angel is saying to joseph and she shall bring forth a son af, af, and thou shalt call his name shamwa his name yeshua which they have the Yeshua, and the so-called Jews say Yeshua. Okay, explain okay right. So now here they have the name of the Messiah. In Hebrew, they have it Yeshua. Now is that correct? We're gonna find out. From there, I want you to go to um, Acts chapter seven. Read in the English, verse forty-four and forty-five. Okay. Acts chapter 7, verse 44 and 45. Okay, it says, Acts 45, 745. 44 and 45. Okay, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. So now it's giving you the point of reference. It's referring to Moses and the Israelites when they had the tabernacle in the wilderness. Read. As he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Right, the Ark of the Covenant, read. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. Now it says Jesus here in the English. Who brought in the children of Israel into the land of Canaan? It was Joshua. But here the scholars have it translated Jesus. Read on. Into the possession of the Gentiles. Right, which was the land of Canaan. Read. Whom the Most High drave up before the face of our fathers. Right, because under Joshua, they were destroying the Canaanites. Okay, but as I stated, the scholars have Joshua translated in the English as Jesus. Read. And, it's who, excuse me, before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So now, in verse 45, they have the name Joshua translated Jesus in English. 
So I want you to read in the Hebrew, verse 45 only. We're going to get the name of Jesus as the scholars have it translated. Okay, and this is what it says in the Hebrew. Wa abaf yanawa am yahawashai. It says, and our fathers also yahawashai. So now, they have Jesus translated here in Acts 7 verse 45 as yahawashai. So now, what I'm going to do, I have it written down on the piece of paper. We're going to find out which of those two translations are the correct translation. Which is the correct translation? Okay. So in Acts chapter 7, verse 45, instead of Joshua, the scholars inserted the name Jesus. And in Hebrew, they have it translated Yahawashai. Okay? With these characters here, which is pronounced Yahawashai. That's how you pronounce the name here. This is what's in Acts chapter 7, verse 45, okay? You have the ya, ha, wa, sha, and the i sound here, pronounced Yahawashai. That's in Acts 7, verse 45. However, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, they have Jesus translated Yahshua, okay? As you see here, Yahshua. So now you have two different names for the name Jesus. Which one is the correct translation? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8. Okay? It says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So now what this is speaking of is also Joshua, when he led them into the land of Canaan, led the Israelites into the land of Canaan. Here, once again, in English, they have the name Joshua translated Jesus. Let's read the uh, Hebrew. Kaya alwa abayam Yahawashai. Say, showing you right here, speaking about Yahawashai. Right, so now it says Yahawashai rather than Yahshua. So now, there may be some confusion in your mind as to what is the proper name. Is it Yahshua that everyone claims it to be? Or is it Yahawashai? That's the secret one. Yahawashai, you don't hear that one mentioned. Yet you hear the name Yahshua or Yeshua pushed throughout the whole earth. So the key to understanding what is the correct name is Exodus. Let's go to Exodus in the Bible. Exodus chapter 23. We're going to read verses 20 and 21. Okay, so you have two, two names now. Is it Yahshua, which is Joshua, or is it Yahawashah? Okay, we know the name of the Savior would be He Saves, or He Delivers, because that's what the angel told Joseph to name him. So now, let's go to Exodus chapter 23. Let's read verses 20 and 21. Now, the scenario is this. The Most High is talking to Moses, and he's going to tell Moses about a particular angel that's going to lead the children of Israel by day and by night, <laughs> and lead them into the land. Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21, read. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Beware of this particular angel, this special angel. Read. And obey his voice. Obey his voice. Read. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, <coughs> for my name is in him. So now, the Most High told Moses, he said, Beware of this angel, for my name is in him. Okay. So now it says, My name is in him. Who was this angel that led the children of Israel? Hold that. What we're going to do is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 to 11. Okay. The Bible gives you the keys to everything. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's start at verse 1. Because we're going to prove to you that that angel was the one you call Christ. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant 
how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Right, because remember, this angel led them by a cloud by day and a fire by night. Read. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Go ahead. And did, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Right, the same spiritual meat that we ate of was the learning of the law. Read. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. And the same spiritual drink that all Israel drank was the learning of the law. Go ahead. For they drank of that, of that spiritual rock that followed them. That spiritual rock that followed them. Read. And that rock was Christ. That rock was who? Christ. That foundation, that cornerstone was Christ. Read on. But with many of them, but with many of the children of Israel, read, the Most High was not well pleased, read, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Read. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Right, because our forefathers were lusting after idolatry, they were going after, uh, they were committing adultery, all manner of wickedness, the breaking of the law our forefathers were doing in the wilderness. Read. Neither be ye ad uh, idolaters, as was some of them. Like like some of you are today. You're worshiping Allah. That's a rock. You're an idolater. Some of you are in the Roman Catholic Church worshiping statues, talking about Santa Maria, San Pedro, San Juan. Okay, Jesus Cristo, and you got little crucifixes around your necks, kissing it and crossing your lives out like all that madness you're doing. Okay? So you're an idolater now, just like you were in the past. Read. As it, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And they were doing wickedness. Read. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed. Neither let us commit all manner of wickedness, as some of them did. Read. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Right, because the Most High commanded Moses. He said, look, kill them Israel. They were top Israel, like captains. He said, kill them. And how many fell? In one day, three and twenty thousand. Read. Neither let us tempt Christ. Neither let us tempt Christ. Read. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Hmm, wait a minute. Now when you check out that story, the serpents came. The angel of the Lord sent the serpents to bite the children of Israel. And Moses cried to the Lord. And the Lord said, make ye a serpent of grass. And whosoever of Israel would look upon that serpent, they would be healed. And you know what the Israelites were doing? No, I'm not looking. Let's like a lot of you today. I'm not looking. And they dropped dead. Okay. So who were they tempting? Christ. Christ. That was the angel that the Lord told Moses, beware of him. Don't play with him. Okay. Because my name is in him. Okay. It's dreadful, terrible power. Right. To read on, <laughs> neither murmur, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. And were destroyed of the destroyer. Who was that destroyer? Christ. So now, the, that proved you that it was Christ was the angel. Now let's go back to Exodus. <laughs> Christ was that angel that the Lord spoke of. We just proved that. So read Exodus chapter 23, verse 21 to 20. Before we go to Exodus, let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 14 to back up what we read in uh, Corinthians. John chapter 3 verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, it says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. It's give, give you a point of reference. Go back and read the story in the book of Numbers, chapter 21 verse 9 on down. Where Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness to the children of Israel. Read. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Even so, the same way, that's what it means. Even so must Christ be lifted up. To who? The children of Israel. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what is the reference to? Just as Moses, back in the wilderness, and written of in Numbers 21, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness to the children of Israel, the Most High told Moses to tell Israel, Whosoever shall look upon a serpent shall be healed. But over rebellious Israel was like, No, I'm not going to look. So a lot of them was put to death. 
So in the same manner must Christ be lifted up to the children of Israel, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, read on. For the Most High so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Now you should, un this helps you better understand what verse 16 is talking about once you start at verse 14. The, what's the reference? The children of Israel. Just as Moses lifted up the children, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness to the children of Israel, so must also Christ be lifted up to the children of Israel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We gave his son to who? The children of Israel. That word world means a society of people. Look it up. Read on. That whosoever. Here's the same word that whosoever of the children of Israel. Read. Believe it in him should not perish, but have e everlasting life. So what you gonna do about that? Huh? You gonna run on a tangent now and twist scriptures, okay, and bend it to what you want? Look up the word world. It means society of people. Who is verse 14 talking about? Israel. Who is verse 15 talking about? Israel. Who is verse 16 talking about? Israel. What is the Bible talking about? Israel. Okay. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So now, that we have that understanding. Let's go back to Exodus 20 and verse 23, I believe it was. 20 and 21, I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 23, verse 20 and 21. Okay. And it says, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Right now, who is that angel? that led the children of Israel, that followed them, that destroyed them in the wilderness and all that? Christ. We just read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Read. Beware of him. The Lord said, told Moses, beware of this angel. Read. And obey his voice. And obey his voice. Read. Provoke him not. Don't provoke this angel, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For he's so terrible, he will not pardon your transgressions. Read. For my name is in him. For my name is in him. That's the key. That part right there is what we want. For my name is in him. So we know that this angel was Christ, whom you call today Jesus Christ, okay? When it says, for my name is in him, it means the sound of the Father's name is in the name of this angel, Christ. So now, let's look at it again. Let's, well, first you got to know the name of the Father, as we proved already. What was the name of the Father? I'm going to pull up this white sheet of paper, and I'm going to show you. His name is Yahweh. Okay, as we proved. Yahweh is the Father's name, meaning He is. So now, the angel told Joseph that the name of the Messiah would mean He saves, for He would save His people. So the meaning is different. So in Exodus, when it says, my name is in him, it means the sound of the Father's name is in the name of Christ. So now let's look at the two names we've discovered for Jesus. Let's look once again in Matthew 121, where it said Jesus, it said Yahshua. Hmm. The Father's name, the sound of the Father's name is not in that. Yahshua means he saves. Uh, let's, when we went to Acts 7 and 45, the scholars translated the name Jesus, Yahawashai, just like in Hebrews 4 and 8. Is the name Yahawah, the sound, is that sound in the name Yahawashai? Yes! Yes, it is! Yahawashai. The sound, the first three characters give you the sound Yahawah. Then you have Shai at the end. Yahawashai, meaning he saves or he delivers. This is the correct name that you ought to be praying in. Yahweh Shai. Read Exodus 20 again. Exodus 23 verse 20 and 21. Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. For my name is in him. Meaning the sound of my name is in the name of him. Of his name. 
What's that name? Yahweh Shai. Not Yahshua. Okay? And you know, you so-called white people, you bastards, I tie Mumza to you, okay? Because what you did, right, when we examine the Tanakh, all through the Old Testament, you know what you bastards did? You took the name Yahshua out for Joshua. Any numbskull can hear Yahshua is Joshua. Any numbskull. Okay? But what did you do in the Tanakhs? You took out the name Yahshua in the Old Testament. You put Yahweh Shah. Then when you get to the New Testament Hebrew Bibles, for Jesus it says Yahshua. So you got all the people that re realize they're trying to call on a correct name. You got them thrown off. You got them calling in the name, praying in the name Yahshua, which is not correct as we've just proven to you. All our people are to pray in the name Yahweh Shai. Get um, Matthew 19, verse 16 and 19. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Okay. Matthews 19 and 16. And this is what it says. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, we were just discussing eternal life when we were reading in John 3, 16. For whosoever believeth them shall not perish, but have eternal life. So now, this man, this rich Israelite, came to Christ and said, Good master, what thing should I do to have eternal life? Let's find out the answer. Read. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is the Most High. That is Yahweh. Read. But if thou wilt enter into life. Now here's the key to having eternal life. Read. Keep the commandments. Are you Israelites keeping the commandments? You're sitting in the Baptist church. Are you keeping the commandments? The Pentecostals? No, you're not. There are many. There are many commandments. Are you keeping Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread? Are you keeping uh, uh, the Day of Atonement? No. You're keeping Christmas. You're keeping Easter. Okay. You're, are you keeping the dietary laws? Are you eating shrimp? Are you eating pork? Are you eating lobster? Okay, because you can't eat those things according to the dietary law. Okay, so now, from there. Did we go down to verse uh, 19? Go ahead, read down to verse 19. Honor thy father and thy mother. Honor your father and your mother. In that order, too. Read. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Who's your neighbor? When you read Leviticus 19, 17, 18, and 19, it tells you your neighbor is the children of your people. But no, a lot of you so-called blacks and Latinos, you hate one another. You despise one another. And you love the other nations before you love your own brother. Read on. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Yahweh shall I said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Right, so now from there, go to John 14 and 15. Okay, John chapter 14, verse 15. Got it? 14, 15. Okay, that's good. If you love me, this is what Christ said for all you hypocrites. If you love me, you claim to believe in Jesus. You love Jesus. Oh, I love the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. I hope you Israelites out there, I hope you're listening to this. Keep my commandments. From there, let's go to um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Okay. Read it. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed. And whatsoever you do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Yahweh Do all in the name of the Lord Yahweh So whatever you do in word or deed, you're supposed to do it in the name of Yahweh Not Yahshua, not Jesus. You're supposed to do all and all that you say, do it in the name of Yahweh Okay, was that it? Go ahead. Giving thanks to the Most High, 
and the Father by him. Right, so when you are eating the food according to the law, give thanks in the name of Yahweh Shai. Okay, when you pray to Yahweh, pray in the name Yahweh Shai. So I hope you Israelites are not at home asking the Lord to bless your pork, bless your shrimp, so that you can eat it. You can't do that, and we're going to prove that. But first, let's go to John 14 and 13, because I had omitted this, and it's very important. This is the reason why they uh, changed the name of Yahweh and put Yeshua in there. Read. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. You're asking for things in the name Yeshua. Okay? You're supposed to ask in the name of Yahweh Shah. Okay? And this is Christ speaking. All right? This is what Christ himself is saying. Go ahead. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Right. So for you Israelites that are not accepting Yahweh Shah, you're not glorifying the Father. Okay? You're going to be put to death. Read on. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, let's get to the next part. Read. If ye love me. If you love me, you're asking for things in the name of Christ, in the name of Yahweh Shai now. If you love the Lord, if you love Christ, if you love Yahweh Shai, keep my commandments. So does that mean you can eat pork and shrimp and lobster? Hell no. You can't do that. And celebrate the pig and Christ. Right. And celebrate. Thank you. And celebrate Christmas and Easter and Good Friday and Kwanzaa. And hallelujah and all this other kind of stuff. Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. You can't do that. That's not in the commandments of the Lord. Go to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 real quick. Because this is the famous scripture. A lot of you in the church like to pervert it. Where is it? Get it. First right. Timothy started at the top. Oh, I'll get says, it in a moment. It says eating anything? Yeah, that one. Oh, no, uh, forbidden to marry? That's it. Start up there. First Timothy 4. First Timothy 4 and 3. Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meat. Start at the, at the, at the top of the verse. Because right. that's, that's very important. Right. First Timothy, uh, Timothy 4 and 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times in the latter times speaking of today these are the latter times read that some shall depart from the faith many of you Israelites have departed from the faith what is the faith? the Bible read and read up in this verse again now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith right you Israelites read given he the seducing spirits, giving heed to seducing spirits like the Baptists, the Roman Catholics, the Pentecostals, those are seducing spirits in those organizations. Read. And doctrines of devils. And doctrines of the so-called white man. Read. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Because on one side of your mouth you say, oh, the laws of God were done away with. Then when somebody wants to sleep with your wife, no, 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 you can't do that, brother. That's wrong. You're a hypocrite. But you just said the Lord that God has done away with. You're sinning, my brother. Okay, so therefore, there is no such thing as adultery. There is no such thing as homosexuality. Because you made the statement in your perverse, psychotic organization that the laws are done away with. And then you say, if you want eternal life, believe in Jesus. Christ told you, if you want eternal life, Keep the commandments. And whatsoever you do, do all in the name of Yahweh Shai. Read on. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Right, them lying philosophies you're in has your conscience seared with a hot iron. Read. Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry, with, like within a Roman Catholic organization. They say to the priest, you can't have a wife, when according to the law, you could have a wife, okay? What is forbidding to marry cause? It causes you to go into perversity. Masturbation, if you ain't got a wife, you go into that. Or then it leads into homosexuality. Pornography, child molestation, all kind of wickedness, okay? If you don't have a wife, read. And commanded to abstain from meat. And commanding to abstain from meat. Oh, uh, you can't eat this particular meat on Good Friday, you can only eat fish. Where's that? Okay? 
Don't eat meat. Some churches say don't eat meat, just eat a vegetable. Commanding to abstain from meats, read, which the Most High have created to be received with thanksgiving of them, of them which believe and know the truth. So that's the key right there. To be received with thanksgiving of them which believe, believe what? The Bible and know the truth. What's the truth? Hold that real quick. Let's go real quick now to Psalms uh, 119, verse 142. Yeah. Psalms 119, verse 142. <clears throat> real, let's find out what the truth is that we are to believe in. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. And thy law is the truth. So what you going to do about that now? So let's go back to Timothy now and read that verse again in the way so that they can understand it. Verse 3, once again. Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meats, which the Most High have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth, meaning the law. The law! The law! I hope you understand that. Now read on. For every creature of the Most High is good. Every creature of the Most High is good according to what? The law. The dietary law written of in Leviticus 11. Read. And nothing to be refused. And nothing according to the dietary law that's clean for you to eat is to be refused. Read. If it be received with Thanksgiving. If it be received with thanksgiving, giving thanks in the name of Yahawashai. Read. For it is sanctified by the word of the Most High and prayer. Where the food sanctified at mean made clean? In the law. The law. I hope you understand that. Levi Leviticus 11. So now, let's go to John chapter 3, verse 18. Okay. John chapter 3, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth on Jesus Christ, Yahawashai, is not condemned. Read. But he that believeth not is condemned already. So you Israelites in Chicago, Canada. wherever you, Brooklyn, wherever you might be, Canada, Canada that don't believe on Yahawashai, you're condemned already. Any Israelite that does not believe on Yahweh is condemned already. And believing on him, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Read. Because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of the Most High. And he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of the Most High. That goes back to when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Whosoever of Israel believeth on him should not perish. That whosoever means Israel should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, so now, real quick, let me get, um, let me see, John chapter, bear with me one moment, John chapter 14, I believe, 15 and 23, John chapter 15 and verse 23, that's what I want, this is what Christ said out of his own mouth, he that hateth me, hateth my father also. So you Israelites that hate Yahweh Shai, you like to mock and say, J.C. <laughs> you hate him, you hate the Father also. So guess what? You're going to be put to death. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You ain't coming in this except through Yahweh Shai. Now get Philippians 2 and 9. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. You got it? Yeah. Read. Wherefore the Most High also have highly exalted him, the Most High hath highly exalted his son, the Messiah, Yahawashai, read, and given him a name which is above every name. And gave him a name which is above every name. What's that name? Yahawashai. Why is that name above every name? Because the Father's name is in his name. Yahawah, the sound of Yahawah is in his name. What's that name? Yahawashai, meaning he saves. Was that it? Okay, now, from there, let's go to John chapter 6, to round us all up, John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45. 
John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him. So you can't come into this truth except the Most High call you. Okay? So those of you that's coming in, come. All you Israelites, you're supposed to come and learn this truth. So read it again. <coughs> no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him. And I will raise him, raise him up at the last day. And I will raise him up at the last day. Read. It is written in the prophets. It is written in the prophets. What is that talking about? The Old Testament. Read. And they shall be all taught of the Most High. How are you being taught? Through this Bible. In the name of Yahweh. Okay. Read. Every man, therefore, that have heard and have learned of the Father, cometh unto me. So if you've learned the Old Testament, you know the Old Testament prophesies about Christ. Okay? You would accept Yahweh Shai then. Real quick, let's go to um Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Okay. This is out of Yahweh Shai's own mouth for you, a lot of you hypocrites out there. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Stop! He said out of his own mouth Christ said, don't even think that I've come to destroy the laws of the Most High. He did not come to destroy the laws. So a lot of you say, when Christ came, he did away with the law. You're a liar. Read on. Or the prophets. Or the prophets. Christ didn't come to destroy the prophecies written of in Isaiah, Malachi, Ezekiel, Amos, okay, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He didn't come to destroy the prophets. Go ahead. I am not come to destroy. Christ did not come to destroy what was written in the law or in the, written in the prophets. Read. But to fulfill. What did he come to fulfill? What was written concerning him dying for the nation of Israel, being a sacrifice for the nation of Israel. Why? Because Israel had the law of sacrifice. Christ fulfilled the law of sacrifice. Read. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass. So has heaven and earth passed away? No. You're sitting on earth. You're looking up at the heavens. Read. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. So the laws are still in full effect. Okay? The dietary law, the moral laws. There's over 600 laws in the scriptures. You, try, you have to go to the best of your ability to keep those laws. Go to uh, John chapter 10 and verse 1, then jump to 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, let's find out what this door is. Jump to verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So Christ is the door of the sheep. Now, go back to verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door, meaning if you don't come through Christ, through Yahawashai, if you don't accept him, go ahead, not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, some other way, like uh, I don't got to go through him, I could just pray to the Father on my own. I could be accepted as a Baptist. I can be accepted as whatever. I don't need the law, okay? I can do whatever I want, and God will love me. God will accept me. Read. The same is a thief and a robber. The same is a thief and a robber. What are you at home? If you don't accept Christ, you're a thief. What are you? A robber. So now let's go to John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We already explained what the truth is, the law. The law is the truth, okay? So if you're going to say you believe in Christ, you, you love him, you accept him, you must go through the law. You must pray in his proper name, Yahawashai, to the Father. Yahweh. Read. No man. Read this verse again. Yahawashai saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I hope you other little Israelite groups, I hope you understand that. You don't accept Yahweh Shah, you ain't, the Father does not accept you. And this includes you Israelites that say, you're just going to keep the law of Moses, you don't accept Christ, you don't need Christ. 
you're not going to be accepted, okay? You must keep the law through Christ, okay? What does that mean? That's, gra that's what grace is about, knowing that if you break the law, Christ died for the sins of Israel, okay? Now, does that mean we should willingly go out and commit adultery? No. Does that mean you should willingly sit there and eat shrimp and pork and lobsters and crabs? No. Keep the law to the best of your ability through Christ. Whatsoever you ask in Christ's name shall be done. Now, let's go to Joel chapter 2. Let's start at verse 27. We're going to read down. Joel 2, 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. So the Most High, the Father, is in the midst of Israel, only Israel. He's not in the midst of the Baptist Church or the Pentecostals, vice, or so on and so on. Okay? He's not in Muslims. Okay, read on. And that I am Yahweh, your power. And that I am Yahweh, your power. Read. And none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And my people, Israel, shall never be ashamed. Read verse 27 again. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord, your power, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So how will you know that the Lord is in the midst of Israel? You need teachers, okay? That's why in Romans 10, 13, it says, how will they hear without a preacher? Okay, so the house of David, the brothers you see teaching you, we are the teachers. Okay, read on. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So the all flesh is making reference to is all Israel. Read. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And when it says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, let me say this. It does not mean for your daughters to be jumping up in the church talking about, I got a prophecy, I got a word of the Lord, all out of order. No. When the Lord sends a message, whether it comes to the men or the female, or the, let me stick with the daughter, that's the subject, right, this moment. She either tells the husband who reveals it to the congregation. Okay, the daughters do not jump up. Oh, I got a revelation, and they teaching everybody. That's out of order. Okay? Like when Miriam been up teaching. Okay? 